your trusted source for information on the energy transition. This is the Insider's Guide to Energy podcast. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and today with me is Scott Case, the founder of Zeta Watts. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Chris. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. I, I love having fellow entrepreneurs on the program. You've got an entrepreneurial background. Um, what exactly are you working on? Well, I've spent the last 30 years of my life building all kinds of different companies um, from very large scale businesses. I was the founding chief technology officer of Priceline.com, which is probably the well, most well-known business. I've worked in global public health uh, and I've built SaaS businesses and e-commerce platforms and I found myself over the last few years looking at both climate change and specifically clean energy. And the biggest challenge that I think we're facing is we need to double or triple the total supply of, um, of electricity in the United States and probably globally. And we need to do it really, really fast. And so the question is, what are the big barriers to accomplishing that goal? And uh, how do we figure out how to create the leverage we need uh, to get there as quickly as we possibly can. It all should be carbon-free energy, and uh, we have the scalable technologies to do that. Uh, so the key thing is figuring out how to overcome some of the bottlenecks uh, in the process. Okay, so that's a pretty bold statement, a pretty ambitious plan. You're a technologist. You, you make software. So where did the two cross? Where is the intersection between technology and getting this clean energy that you're talking about? So part of the big uh, challenge is on, on the one side for project developers, um, it's very clear that in order to get a project financed, uh, one of the biggest barriers is they need a long-term offtake agreements. They've got to have somebody who's willing to buy typically the power and then on top of that, buy the environmental attributes, the renewable energy certificates that ride along with that power over some period of time, 10, 15, 20 years. And so project developers in order to get their financing, they need to have these off takers. On the other side of, the, of our market, you have corporate buyers. We focus on the voluntary corporate market, many of whom have set um, very ambitious net zero clean uh, you know, carbon, carbon goals. Um, in addition to a big component of that is their clean energy programs and their goals there. And when you unpack the corporate side of the equation, for the vast majority of corporations, they're really focused on an emissions problem. It's less about how they procure their electricity and more about the emissions from the electricity that they buy in the market today. And in the United States, 60% of our electricity generation on average is fossil fuels still. So if you're a corporate buyer of electricity, you've got this big emissions footprint. What do you do about that? How do you demonstrate that you're mitigating that, um, that usage of electricity? And so for us, we saw the opportunity from a software perspective to say the current model for bringing both the buyers of that clean energy and the project developers together is an over-the-counter bilateral market that on its best day is opaque. It's really, really high friction. It's very complicated. And so what we've done is take a software mindset and a product approach and said, well, what could we do to make it as easy as possible for that corporate buyer to mitigate their scope to emissions from their electricity and make it super easy for project developers who often have a portion of their project, they've got offtake for, a, let's say, a PPA with either a utility or a, another large buyer, but they have a piece of the puzzle that they need to finish uh, from an offtake standpoint. How can we bring those together? commoditize the product on both sides of a market and ultimately use software to figure out how to distribute and allocate the volume from the project developers and the demand volume from the customer side. So we can break down this bilateral transaction that tends to be where the friction lies and where it fails. A couple things you said um, made me wonder. First one is that this is really about environmental and not about energy. Because what I've seen is when energy prices low, people went to the cheaper energy. So when solar became cost effective, it became popular. So I'm, I'm not convinced totally there. But the second part that comes to mind 
is you know some of the SEC and public companies and filings and things that they're going to be responsible for. You brought up scope two emissions. How do you play in that? Because this sounds very reactive. It sounds like I need to make sure that I'm clean. Is it is it a paper trail that you're offering, or what, what what's helping me meet my SEC filings or even my state and local filings? So I'm gonna I'm gonna press hard on the the emissions part of the the challenge. If you're a large corporation and you have uh, load across the entire country, right? So you've got offices and places, maybe you have data centers or manufacturing facilities. Your your load is distributed over maybe the entire country at some point, um, certainly multiple ISOs and RTOs. And what you're really trying to do is to figure out how do I demonstrate that I am mitigating the electricity I'm using day in and day out. And the best way to do that is to bring new generation online commensurate with that usage. So an example, if I'm currently using 100,000 megawatt hours a year of electricity, what I really like to do is to bring 100,000 megawatt hours of generation online, let's say over a 10 year period. You know, so I can say, hey, every time I'm using a megawatt hour, there's another megawatt hour, could be anywhere in the country, that's generating a clean, a clean electricity, which in, in the ideal case is, um, is basically mitigating um, a otherwise natural gas fired megawatt hour, for example. So that's the corporate emissions problem. But they want to bring this new generation online. Let me let me interrupt here. Yeah. So not every megawatt of energy is created equal, right? So a clean, I might be somewhere where there's a lot of solar and create a clean energy megawatt wherever I happen to be. Maybe I'm in Arizona, but if I'm in you know the the Northeast, maybe doing it and not having the same capacity. How, how do they really offset each other? Because they're not actually the same, are they? No, that's and that's one of the biggest challenges is it's it's even more complicated if you if you go to what is the current standard for when you say I buy 100% clean energy, which is um, I buy an unbundled rack from a project that was built five years ago that's not even in the same market. Right? So we think about these as incremental steps. And you're right, a megawatt hour that is from a project that is generated in a um, in a, he a heavy renewable market, let's say in Texas and ERCOT, is not the same as a megawatt hour consumed in West Virginia, which has a very high emissions footprint. The, the highest level matching would be to look at the emissions footprint in both places, both where the load is and where the supply is. The challenge is, is that we are nowhere near ready to calculate the data required to, to answer that question today. It's moving in that direction, but we're not there yet. So what is the next best thing we can do? Well, it turns out that in Texas, it's about 50% fossil fuel today. So bringing new generation online in Texas to clean the Texas grid is just as valuable if you look at the entire picture of what we're doing. And that's what we believe at Zettawatts is so important is to say, if 100% of all the electricity that was used in America was generated carbon free, we wouldn't be having a discussion about what the emissions uh, footprints would be or what 24 um, seven CFE would be, be looking like. What we'd be saying is we're already there. So from our perspective right now in the transition, probably for the next 20 years, bringing new generation online pretty much anywhere in the country much, much faster is a high impact action to take. And we ought to do as much as we possibly can. Got it. All right. So what, what's this market look like? If, if you're a company and you're trying to do this, where is this market and how does it work? So at Zeta Watts, we've created something called an additionality rack. We've really given a name to something that has been, that has happened occasionally, but we're trying to make it happen a lot more often. So an additionality rack is a competitive offering to a virtual power purchase agreement. And what it is, put simply, it's a fixed price forward contract to buy just the environmental attributes from projects that are currently under development. So these are, uh, I'm going to buy a 10-year strip of 100,000 megawatt hours a year at a fixed price from a project that is currently being developed somewhere in the country. Or if I'm looking to match up geographically, I can specify what ISO or RTO is there. And so we facilitate this through something we call the AREC market. Um, and so the marketplace allows buyers to set prices and volume uh, of demand, and it lets project developers uh, 
provide their projects and how much uh, generation they expect to have online in 2025, 2026, 2027. It's all matched against the COD. So everything is designed to be pre-COD contracts in place, which is where we define the additionality benefit. The corporations get the benefit of that additionality and that that high impact that they're having by helping bring a new project on, on online on the grid. And at the same time, they don't have to deal with the complexity of a virtual power purchase agreement, which uh, I don't know how many of your listeners understand that, but that's a very high, high complexity, high risk asset uh, that requires um, both the buyer to fully understand what they're getting into for the next 10 years in terms of marking their books to market and dealing with the clean energy supply uh, changes in the overall wholesale market, in addition to what the project developer needs to manage on their side. And how big a market do we need to have this be market kind of pricing to have some value of having it be a market? How many participants does it take to really get this going? We're already seeing a market form with dozens of participants. Um, it's probably gets really, really tight at hundreds in the market. What you're seeing on the corporate side is that there are uh, pr probably a thousand to 2000 public corporations that are going to have to file those disclosures you mentioned as part of the SEC. Companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, in their public filings, they're going to tell you exactly what their usage is, and they're going to tell you about having put in place power purchase agreements or virtual power purchase agreements and how impactful those are. You know, Microsoft's report says something like 13.5 gigawatts of new generation that they've built. Well, if you're any one of the other, let's say, I don't know, 1,800 to 1,900 companies that haven't done anything like that, your storyline looks pretty weak. Right. You're maybe you're saying I've got 100 percent clean energy, but you're buying wind racks from Texas wind farms that were built 10 years ago. And that's your overall strategy. That's not going to cut it because investors are increasingly holding the standards higher for themselves about what they believe is high impact. We expect the greenhouse gas protocol and SBTI to start to change their expectations. And as you pointed out, there are municipalities that are already raising the bar, like in Boston, uh, the Birdo Act requires you to either buy uh, compliance recs in Massachusetts, or you have to demonstrate that you're bringing new generation online commensurate with what your usage is in that market. And so I think the trend line is going to move towards the desire and requirements to have higher and higher impact. And the SEC disclosures are going to allow you to compare company to company, not just on what they're using, what their emissions are, but if they've set a goal, how are they making progress towards that goal in the most impactful way? So how mature is this? You, you mentioned dozens of folks doing this today. Where are we on the maturity scale? We are very, very, very early. We anticipate that this is an S-curve, but we're probably two or three years away from really starting to scale. Even the current PPA market is relatively small. I think there are probably 120 to 130 deals done in the United States for on the voluntary side. Um, but that is growing at a very rapid pace because more and more corporations are looking for solutions like additionality recs to, as you pointed out, to prepare for their required disclosures that are coming from the SEC starting in 2026 for large companies and 2027 for others. And most companies are starting to plan for what are they going to publish and how are they going to be evaluated in doing so? And so we're seeing more demand for these kinds of solutions. And then how do they interact with this? Is it, is it a portal that they log into or how, how does this all work? Walk me through a, a user experience, please. Sure. So as a customer, um, you can go to AREC market, A-R-E-C market.com. You set up an account, it's totally free. And we take you through a planning cycle. We ask you about how much your current usage is. And then we talk about maybe what your existing programs might be and what your gap is. And we then give you a comparison between if you were to buy additionality recs at a fixed price, how does that stack up against, let's say, continuing to buy spot recs on an annual basis? We then help those typically sustainability leaders at these companies understand what their strategy is going to be. Are they going to try to get to 100% right away? Do they stagger them and, and sort of eat through it over, let's say, 25% a year for the next four years? And they sort of add strips along the way. So they come up with a strategy. 
they typically then will bring that and have the budget conversation with their their financial counterparts, the CEOs, in some cases, maybe even their boards. And then ultimately, you can make an offer in the AREC market. You specify exactly what volume you want, what's the price that you want. If you have any other geographic constraints, I only want this in CAISO or I'm interested in um, ISO New England. We then aggregate that demand up. You give us an expiration date, typically 90 days. And we have dozens of project developers with each of which have probably five or 10 different projects in play that are interested in selling into our market. We set the price. If the project developer is interested in selling at that price, then the deal's done. If the, if the project developer says, I, I wouldn't sell at $10, but I'd sell at 12, uh, it gives the opportunity for any of our buyers to buy it now at that alternate price. And um, Zettawatt sits in the middle. So it's not a bilateral market. We don't match the project developer and a, and a, a customer or a, a corporate buyer. We are the seller to that corporate buyer and we're the buyer from the project, which allows us to create more liquidity in the market because we can distribute that demand across three or four projects that might only have 10 or 20% of a project available. And we can distribute the risk back to the, to the corporate side by aggregating that demand and not having a single project exposed to a single customer. Now, is this a temporary, long-term temporary problem, meaning that once we have renewable energy resources for everybody, we don't need this market that you're establishing? So this is a, a window of opportunity that, to do this? Um, I would really be delighted if I could stand here and say in 20 years, we will be 100% renewable energy in the United States. I don't think that's possible. Um, absent some kind of you know miracle technological breakthrough that we can't even spell yet, let alone what we see on the drawing boards today. I believe we're going to continue to have fossil fuel generation as a part of our fuel mix well through 2050, in which case there will always be a need for corporate buyers to navigate and mitigate some portion of their emissions footprint along the way. And the main reason for this is that the demand side on the on the load side of our usage of electricity is going to continue to scale at a rate that is going to outpace our ability to deploy new generation. And so we've got these competing lines of, hey, we want to electrify our entire transportation system. You know, EVs up and down the entire transportation stack. Well, that's going to dramatically increase the total load. We're electrifying almost all of our built environment. Uh, so when we put all those heat pumps in, they're going to use a lot more electricity across the board. And despite a lot of hard work and efforts, uh, we are going to face massive heat waves and giant disruption in, in the climate change. And our resiliency to that is going to require more electricity. If it's hotter everywhere for longer, guess what? We're going to have to put a lot more air conditioning in, and that's going to use a lot of electricity. So I see the load side of the equation doubling or tripling over the next 30 to 40 years. And as a result, the pace at which we can bring new generation online isn't going to be able to keep up. So I think we've got a very nice business, but if we could be out of business in 10 years because we solved this problem, that would be an excellent outcome for us. And I guess if it's a market, is it a regulated space? Is this going to be regulated or is it already just by definition regulated? We use the same underlying system that uh, the registry system for the renewable energy certificates today. So we're not creating anything new at the kind of the accounting mechanism for how a megawatt hour of electricity and, a, and therefore a, a renewable energy certificate gets minted. All of that rides along the same systems and the same uh, basic regulation around it. What we've introduced it is just a, a way to buy that is an audit trail for the corporate buyer to be able to say, I put this contract in place with Zettawatts and I have the contract, one or more contracts in place between Zettawatts and the project developer prior to the project going into COD with attestation from the project developer stating that the financial value of those contracts were, were material in getting the project developed. And finally, the marketing rights along with it so that the corporate buyer can say, hey, actually, I, I helped get these three projects off the ground. They're not saying I was the sole off taker for it, 
but they are being able to point to those physical assets and say, our contribution as an off taker uh, played a role in bringing these projects online. Got it. All right. One, one question I'd like to ask us, especially with new and emerging technology is what are some of the risks that would keep this from happening? Probably the biggest risk is, uh, and continues to be the way the credit worthiness of all the participants in these bilateral markets and the, and the, um, the way that that risk is assessed, it's not, it's not as functional because you've got project developers on one side that are having to manage all these different relationships with the, with corporate buyers. And you have corporate buyers who are not experts in figuring out how to underwrite these projects. And so the challenge for us is demonstrating the credit worthiness of Zettawatts that's sitting in the middle and how we balance the market. So for example, we have our corporate buyers put up a 10% deposit um, against their entire uh, contract once we fill it. Well, that gives us an asset that demonstrates some credit worthiness and sort of skin in the game right out of the gate. Our terms are set up front. There's no constant negotiating back and forth. We set our terms up front for both the buyer and for the project developer. And on the project developer side, we have a similar mechanism on the deposits from their side. If they're delayed, there are consequences for them that are, again, structured and upfront. So everybody understands how the market's going to work. We have to get that just right. Today, so is this a margin, it, like, like a margin call. So if their credit worthiness changes, does, does the amount of that 10% get increased that people are putting down? No, it's more about, it's less about their, their risk on a, on a quarter to quarter basis. And it's more about the risk, the perceived risk that a project developers that their financiers have, right? So it's this cascading thing, right? They have a debt provider that's looking at the project developer, that's looking at the off takers, that's looking at the corporate buyers, all that stuff has to flow through. And our job is to make that as smooth as possible and to demonstrate that we can create the level of liquidity on both sides of our market that both sides need without the complexity of more bilateral contracts and insurance and things that drive, basically drive them to blow up and the deals fall apart. All right. So I think I have a pretty good idea of what you guys are doing. It seems very exciting. I, I guess your personal journey, how did you get from, you know, you, you started by saying you were at Priceline and along the way you, you did help. Now you're in energy. What was this journey like? What drove you to this? I spent a lot of time uh, over the last 20 years with a number of uh, peers of mine who had been working in environmentalism, climate change, uh, a little bit around the clean energy side of the equation. I didn't see an opportunity for me as an entrepreneur that I thought maybe there's an opportunity I could build a business here that would be uh, impactful in solving this problem. And I found myself about two and a half years ago at one of those moments as an entrepreneur, I was like, okay, it's time to go you know, start the next thing. This was pre the IRA. And I started to sort of unpack, well, what's the state of the world with climate change and where are we headed from an energy standpoint? I read a book, which is similar back here, called Speed and Scale by John Doerr. And he applies a tool called uh, OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. He basically deconstructs the SBTI curve and says, okay, here's all the stuff we got to do. And I came away reading the book and said, well, holy shit, we've got to electrify everything as fast as possible. And we have to bring all this new generation online. Like what's the holdup? Like what's the big bottleneck in there? And that was my journey was sort of, I spent, I must've had 150 conversations with really smart energy people, uh, project developers, financiers, banks, uh, other types of off takers, just to understand like, what were the big gaps? And even post IRA, uh, it's a, the IRA has accelerated some things and created a much simpler set of vehicles for financing. But everything comes down to who's going to buy the energy from these projects for the next 10 to 20 years. Like that is the open core question to the financing. And so when I saw that, what intrigued me about it was that if that's the, the crux of it, it's not about can we build these things? It's not about are there enough project developers out there? It's not even about whether there's enough capital to finance them. 
it's really about who's going to be the customer on the other side. And for me, when I saw that it was corporate buyers that could play an kind of an outsized role in this, I've spent my entire career working with large corporate buyers for all kinds of different sorts of products. And I thought, okay, this is an area that I understand. I may not be an expert in the energy side of the equation, but I understand a lot about how large companies have to make these kinds of decisions and what what their challenges are. And if we could bring a software mindset approach to it, uh, I think we have a real opportunity to simplify things for the corporate buyer and bring more of these projects online as a result. As an entrepreneur, we may fail at any given time. There may be some like Achilles heel that we haven't discovered yet along the way. Uh, but I always try to focus from a personal standpoint, um, is this worth failing at? Right? This is probably the most important thing humanity could be f- focused on right now. And so if I can do a tiny little part of maybe making a little tiny dent in this thing, it's worth the energy. All right. Well, that's pretty passionate. Uh, that's what I'd expect from an entrepreneur. I, I guess you said in one of your comments that were early on, what does that mean in terms, uh, we walked through a user journey. Is the platform up and are people using it today? You said dozens. So does that imply that there's a, a beta, an alpha? Yeah, there's an, there's an alpha right now. We are, um, we're heading towards getting our first transaction done in the second half of this year. Most of our buyers, as I mentioned, are looking out at uh, 2026 uh, sort of timelines. And so we're lining up the projects now are getting to a place where they're reaching that level of COD. And I expect to have our first set of transactions done before the end of the year. Um, the project developer side, if you've got project developers in your audience, um, we're accepting submissions of projects right now where you get to specify your generation and the price that you're looking for uh, just for the environmental attributes. And so we've been building that out. We started in ERCOT. We've just started to add Kaiso to the mix, um, and, uh, but it will take projects from anywhere in the country. And, uh, and then we're looking, we continue to have conversations with uh, various types of corporations. Um, typically, our sweet spot is uh, companies that are buying between 100,000 and 500,000 uh, megawatt hours a year in electricity. Uh, they, they're big enough to have this class of problem, but they're too small to have the sophistication of a team to navigate a power purchase agreement or a VPPA. And, and just out of curiosity about how big is that market of those, that size companies? How many tend to be out there? Ballpark. In that, in that market, there's probably somewhere between five and 10,000 companies that are in that as a, as a CNI buyer in that zone on a national footprint basis. We work with a lot of channel partners, uh, both energy brokers and uh, energy consultants, and then uh, sustainability consultants. Uh, and so that's the, the size is there in that five to 10,000 range. And then there's where they are in their journey. And there's probably only if you know, hundreds of companies right now, it might be 500 to 1,000 that have done something like a power purchase agreement or a VPPA. And so we're starting with helping them make it a lot easier for them to do more of that uh, as the rest of the market comes along. Well, Scott, this has been fascinating. I appreciate you taking the time to share with myself and my audience. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this content. If you did, don't forget to subscribe and absolutely like or add comments, ask questions. And we'll see you again next time on the Insider's Guide to Energy. Bye for now. Thank you.